Many of you may remember Frederick Tutton from last month when he chatted with Iris Smiles for our February bestselling uh, author series event. But Frederick is a very distinguished writer in his own right as a novelist, short story writer, and essayist. Among his five novels are The Adventures of Mao on the Long March, Talion, A Brief Romance, Tintin in the New World, um, A Van Gogh's Bad Cafe, and The Green Hour. And his last three books, On a Terrace in Tangier, The Bar at Twilight, and My Young Life, a memoir. Along the way, Frederick managed to win three Pushcart Prizes and an O. Henry Prize. Uh, he, re he, he received a Guggenheim Fellowship for Fiction and was presented with the Award for Distinguished Writing from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. He also spent 15 years heading the Creative Writing Graduate Program at City College, which he co-founded, and where he championed the work of students such as Walter Mosley and Oscar Iuelos, who uh, went on to develop their own distinguished careers, and both of whom happen to have been speakers for us. Um, tonight, Frederick will talk about ways of approaching fiction or how the narrative will go. Is that right, Frederick? Something like that. It's close enough. It's, it's, sure, it's, it's a good opening for what I want to say in any case. Okay, Thank over you to you. Much. Thank you very much. I, I, I originally thought, and I think it was listed as such, that I would do a little bit of a reading. But as I find readings deadly most of the time, uh, and I find that uh, I have to shun them, even if they're friends and find ways of escape, I thought I would do something a little different, but something I've been doing and thinking about for a very long time, a very long time. So let me start off. It, it seems a little didactic, forgive me, and we'll come back. And I hope you have questions to ask me. I'd be very happy to talk to you about anything you'd like. As you know, you all know, we've all been told since infancy, since the cradle, write about what you know. Write about what you know. Write about what you know. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, but we know a lot of things other than our childhood. We know a lot of things other than our family, other things about our neighborhood. Our lives really are much more expand, expansive than that and rich, much richer than that. So why not look at materials other than the autobiographical, so to speak? Uh, why not look at materials that aren't always the same traditional format, the well-rounded character, the uh, arc of the tale, all the, things we, all the things we study, learn, and are taught? I wanted to talk about some exceptional work. Uh, some of it I'm sure you know about, so forgive me. But let's start, for example, with the, the Dada, D-A-D-A, -A, the Dada movement in Zurich and then later on all over Europe. You know, who were the young, you're very young people who were very disillusioned with the World War I. They were very disillusioned with the use of language and how it really became propaganda. How <clears throat> they couldn't trust language and were suspicious of the language and the people who wrote those books that are full of what they thought were lies of the, of the culture. And they broke away. They did incredibly strange, interesting things. For example, it was, now it became maybe it's a cliche, but it wasn't then. Cut up little words, take words from newspapers, and throw them in a bowl, stir it up, take out the words, put them on a page, make a new poem. Poetry made abstractly, poetry made without personality. A little later on, Another group of very young people, it was, these are all under 30. We now think of them as old figures already of modernism, but they were under 30. I'm talking about the Surrealists, and I'm talking about predominantly the Surrealist Manifesto. If you don't know it, take a look. You can get it online. It's 1924 by Andre Breton, B-R-E-T-O-N. And it starts off with the idea that we're we are tired of the old and the conventional work. We are tired of the completely classicist and how can I put it, uh, conventional ways of talking about exposition. And he, make, they make, he makes fun of it and, and says, we want something different, something powerfully different. And what is it, what is it different? What is different from the rational world, the rational story, the rational narrative, the reasonable narrative, all of it, it's the world of the unconscious. 
And then he begins to tell you about how he tried to do what we now know as, and he called basically automatic writing. Just, he says, sit at your desk. It's a wonderful moment to read that essay. I'm sure you can find it. He said, put away all thoughts of fame, put away all thoughts of success, put away all thoughts of failure, put away all thoughts of the world around you and sit at your table with your, with your pen and pencil or pen and, pen, uh, pen, pencil and ink, whatever it is, without thinking, just write. And he feels eventually, you, without syntax, without punctuation, just write. And eventually, if you keep doing that, you can train yourself to be in touch with the unconscious and the release of images of the unconscious, which are so fresh. The freshest images will come from the unknown. The freshest images that can make poems from them, uh, are from our unknown being, our unknown self, that's revealed to us through the process of the automatic writing. Now, uh, these, how does that work? It maybe works very well with poems, and there are great surrealist poets like Paul Yalwa and uh, uh, Breton himself. Uh, in fiction, it might be a little more difficult, but there are fictional works that are are, are based on that premise of, of the automatic writing. One is called Magnetic Fields with Breton, and I think his collaborator, but I don't remember his name. And Breton's book called Nadja, about a wandering through the city of Paris. I thought the nighttime was magical because nighttime also was in touch with the unconscious. Very powerful and in a way, very deeply influential. People took it to heart, not everyone, of course, and you can imagine that the stir it would have created to people who are writing a conventional fiction. You know, it's, it's a way of saying no more, goodbye, we've had it. But what's interesting to me is the desire, the desire for freshness, the desire for newness, the desire for, for a, a uniqueness, if you put it that way. <clears throat> And that was, and how it worked out in the other version, of the other uh, other arts. I mean, the, the surrealists were influential in the, the visual arts in, in films. It, they, they, it reached everyone. And these are just this one manifesto with a little band of people who really could just change things. Extraordinary. But most importantly, it was the reason they did it. And one, the most important reason, we don't want convention. We don't want to do what everyone else has done. We are different. We're young. We're fresh. And uh, so there's just, I'm, uh, please understand, if the, the, what I'm trying to say to you all is uh, there's a certain, a certain kind of a premise. The premise is that <laughs> we're not talking about commercial publication. We're not talking about being in the wider world of narratives that everyone everyone knows and everyone publishes, we're not talking about publishing houses, we're not talking about editors and agents, just pure work. What could come from you? That's different, and yours holy. So that, that that's a lot. That's a lot. So let's say we're putting aside all other all other considerations, uh, classroom considerations. Uh, 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 traditional narrative considerations if you're writing short stories or you're writing novels, just for a moment, put that all away. And think about how one can approach writing. When you call it a text, you call it a poem, you call it a prose poem, you call it a short story, it doesn't matter, writing. So I think that's interesting to take a look at. I think it's interesting to see what the, 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 the surrealists are doing. Uh, you can, I'm sure it's so easy now today to find material. It isn't, you have to go to a library and look through catalogs and stuff. It's, yeah, look at the Surrealist Manifesto 1924. Then I'm thinking about um, something I'm very interested in. <coughs> um, Texts made from other texts. Now, there's a 1971 young French theoretician, literary theoretician, Jacques Herman, 
published an essay that was reprinted in Yale Review uh, in English. And um, it was, it was, a, it was a, an essay on how to make texts. And that's what he calls it, text, T-E-X-T-S. And he says, cut out some words from the newspaper, cut out some lines from a recipe book, take a sonnet from Shakespeare, take all the stuff you just want to take at hand, cut it up, put it together, and put it together, and in this way, you will make a text. Now, he doesn't call it a short story, he doesn't call it a poem, he calls it a text. Now, what's the reason for this? The reason, the same reason, in a way, of the Surrealists and the Dada people had, we don't want to do what has been done. We are tired of it, and we distrust what has been done. Now, in this, ca in this case, there's even further implications it was the 70s essay, was a time of radical radicalism all through the world, a radical political world, radical literary world, radical aesthetic world. He says, in a way, if we do this, if we all can make texts like this, there's no hierarchy. There's no a good writer or a bad writer, a better writer, no less an inferior writer. There's just text, a world of text. And it's, a, it's an ultimate, in his view, an ultimate, um, an ultimate striving to literary democracy. It's an idea, it's an interesting idea. The only question is, uh, and that means that everyone's an artist in a way, everyone. And in a way, the Surrealists meant that they didn't, they didn't say that, but the implications of that were there, that everyone who can make automatic writing to go world in the unconscious, how is, <laughs> is your unconscious imagery less valid than someone else's, maybe it's hard to distinguish it. But there was always this attempt to break down, the most important thing to break down what's been known and what's been taught and what we are stuffed with. So that when we come to work, we already have in our mind what a work of art looks like. Someone said that to me a long time ago, a painter and a wonderful artist, Roy Lichtenstein. He said, you know, Fred, the thing is that every time an artist goes to the canvas, he or she knows already what a work of art looks like. So if it's a question of a table full of apples or a nude or whatever it is, we know what a work of art looks like. So we, in some fashion or another, willingly or another, unconsciously or consciously or another, we start to replicate it. We start to write a short story like the short stories we know. We start writing novels like the novels we know. Well, that might work. I mean, certainly you can, people are interested in it, but it's not new, fresh, profound, different, or profoundly different, because we already have the groove in our mind of what a work of art looks like. And that means what a short story looks like, what a novel looks like. Oh, what is this? Is this a novel? <laughs> Years ago, I was on a committee, a uh, nameless committee, or a prize, big prize. And uh, a book came across to me uh, for consideration, for, for nomination. And I thought, first when I started looking at it, I thought, this is terrible. This is, this is, this is a, a joke. And I heard myself say, like a conservative guy, uh, wow, what, this is not writing, this is not fiction. I don't know what this is. <laughs> I heard myself say that, I thought, this Fred, are you saying that? What is this? It's a book, it's a novel by um, Gilbert Sorrentino. He did some very interesting books. I'm sorry to say he died now, not too long ago. Sorrentino's book is called Gold Fools, F-O-O-L-S, instead of Fool's Gold, Gold Fools. What he did is he found uh, a young, young adult book, one of those books which was very, very much in my world and my generation about young people, usually in this case, young people, friends, or maybe cousins or something uh, from the East. And they go to a ranch all the way in the West, maybe Texas, maybe somewhere like that, some relative's ranch to somehow have a new experience. There may be 10, 11, maybe nine, 10, 11, that, that range. And they go to the ranch, and they, uh, there's a guy who's a, sort of the foreman of the ranch, 
Uh, there, you know, there's all cowboys everywhere and all that kind of stuff. And he, he becomes their mentor in the experience of the West. How to ride a horse, how to do a lasso, how to do this. You know, and they're tender, what do you call them, tender feet. You know, they're just kids who don't know anything except what they know from the East. Now, it's a very, it seems, that, that's the book. I mean, the original book, whose name I don't remember now, but I don't think it was called Gold's World. Uh, it's a conventional young adult book. Sorrentino took it and followed it practically chapter by chapter, 24 chapters, chapter by chapter, except that he changed, he wrote, he rewrote some stuff, which means to say every sentence is an interrogation. Every sentence for the whole book, over 300 pages. Now, when I first read it, I thought, this is so annoying. You know, I got the point, it's like a gimmick. That's why I thought it was a gimmick. That's always a favorite word of people who don't like what they don't, what's new for them. Um, and then I said, well, I should just read a little bit more. Now, here's an example. Uh, did the boys ever ride horses? Uh, John, John, the, John the foreman said, do you ever ride a Palomino? Uh, what is a Palomino? Did they get up on the saddle? The whole book is like that. By the time I got about 50, 60 pages, I, I, I ingested it. So every sentence was, I would answer it. It was fascinating how I now became a participant in, with the book. But that wasn't the only thing. It, it just awakened me to so many different ways of thinking about the sentences or thinking about the narrative. Uh, Gold Fool, Gilbert Sorrentino. He also wrote a book called Hotel Splendide. He had taught many, many years at Stanford in creative writing programs. And then he came back east where he was from and, um, you know, and uh, left the world. So uh, I want to save some room to have questions. I don't know how much time I've already used up. Uh, you know, I, I want to be sure we have some, if you care to, if you care to talk. Uh, there's another book. Oh, where did I put it? Here it is. This is strange. Um, I had this book given me some long, long time ago. I always love the cover because the cover is by an artist I, I love so much, Giorgio de, de Chirico. So, and I had the book and uh, it's a novel. It's a novel by a painter, by a great artist, great metaphysical painter. This is this what it is. And uh, I started it like the other books I didn't like in the beginning, and later on I got very taken by them. I started reading it, and I didn't un understand what he was doing. I had no idea what he was doing. I didn't understand it. You know, he's talking about driving and to, at night to Marseille, and then, and then without even a transition, he's in Africa. I mean, it's so without any normative, uh, uh, can I put it, structures that you grab a hold of and follow. And I thought, but that's the wonder of this book. You know, that he broke from it. And now you're with him in this wayward journey, transitionless journey. It's, it's just a wonderful thing if I can recommend it. A lot of books I would hope to have shown you, but I, I'm not really where I am or I should be, so I don't have all my books. Um, I, I, was, I was hoping maybe if I did anything, to, well, maybe I would do something, which is a, another last thing maybe to talk about. Write about what you know. Well. We know about movies. We know about other books. When you think about the, the novel by Jean Rice, Why It's Our Gas O C, it's, it's, a, it's a novel about one of the characters in Wuthering Heights. She, she has a character ready-made for herself, and she just makes a whole novel out of it. Novels made from other novels, made from characters in other novels. We know that. Uh, novels made from or works made, especially po painting or poetry made from paintings or paintings that inspire works. There we are in a big, rich uh, field of gold. Because ever since the early days when people were making paintings from Bible scenes, uh, uh, people were making um, poetry from Bible scenes, poetry from, from Ovid. Uh, I'm thinking of the great Poussin who made great paintings from poems and poems made from paintings. 
there's a whole world, I think there's a whole book about a whole anthology somewhere of poems based on paintings. So when you say, gosh, uh, I don't know what to write about, so what should I write? Well, there's a whole world of playfulness open to you, you know? Just that alone, just to have a painting that you love and write about it in a, in a way that, you know, is interesting to you and to others. So I'm suggesting the unconscious, opening up the unconscious, let it flow out, don't be bound by conventional systems, poetry, a, 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 liter, a visual loss as an influence on your work, other the texts, other books influencing your work, however you want to do it. Um, if you want just to be playful, cut up some stuff and put it together and see what comes out of it. it. Doesn't hurt, it doesn't cost. It might be an interesting thing to try. So I think what I'm gonna do now um, is say, uh, uh, I'll sign off on this. I know, I, oh maybe before that, I think, uh, I, I, I guess what I even said I was gonna do earlier, I wanna tell you about a book I did, most, my most recent book, uh, in le this uh, last uh, summer, I published two books of short stories, one called uh, The Bar of Twilight. And then this one, which is what in line of what we're talking about, I made a lot of uh, drawings. Uh, I was painting and drawing a lot. And I made a, a lot of drawings in pencil and crayon and pastel. And when I had the book, I don't know how it came up, but I thought, I thought uh, I'd like to have a story for each book. So let me just, this is called, this was a book uh, on a terrace in Tangier. And uh, if you could see what I did, here's an example, one of my drawings. And each drawing has a little story. It's interesting because I had the drawings and, and I don't know how I thought about it, but I thought they seem lonely and uh, I think they need something to, to have them more, uh, more companionate, to have them have a little bit more friend, friendships, so to speak. And I thought the text was very small, very brief, very tight. Uh, maybe I'll just read this one if you would like. And then we can stop talking. Can you see that? I don't know. Um, this little story for that drawing is called uh, The Triangle of Desire. My love, we make a triangle, I said, as the morning light came to visit us through the window. You, me, and the clouds. We roused from bed, finally, set out our spoons, cups, and a small loaf of bread on the table, heated the milk and made espresso. She opened the French windows that led to the veranda that overlooked the folding Mediterranean far below. Let's leave the clouds out of this, she said. Why should we share? So that, that's the little stories like that. But that was in line, I guess, for what we've been talking about before, of ways of thinking about telling stories that aren't necessarily always the same way of telling it or the same reasons of telling it. I think that's it for now. And I hope you have something, if anyone's there, to say something to me, ask any questions you like. I'd be very happy to talk with anyone who wants to talk to me. Okay. Sophia, are, did we get any questions or do you want me to ask a question? We don't have any questions yet. So you can. <laughs> okay. Well, let me ask you, Frederick. You, you mentioned that late in your career, you started uh, adding some of your artwork to the books. What did you do in the early part of your career? Were you painting also in the early part of your career? And why uh, did you not, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's a good question. And it leads me to myself, of course, what else? Uh, I think Lewis mentioned my, my memoir, My Young Life. And there, uh, it's what I talk about among others, my young life, I was very young. I wanted to, at 15 to be a painter, an artist. I wanted very much to do that. And I had this fantasy, total ridiculous fantasy that I was gonna to go to Paris 
and I was going to live in the cafes and meet beautiful women and great models and uh, painters and poets. And I was a high school student and I dropped out of high school. I had not a penny, not a cent, and nothing. I didn't speak French, but I didn't think that mattered. I was going to go to Paris and everyone would welcome me. I was an American painter. So I wanted to paint very, very much. The fantasy of it was very appealing to me, the freedom of it, to be a free young person, you know, in, in a world of poets and writers and artists that was so glamorous. Well, it turned out, of course, that I didn't have any money uh, to do it. And I went to Art Students League for take, to take life drawing classes. And I had no idea how to draw the figure. I thought that was essential. I thought you had to learn to draw the figure to become an artist. Picasso did, Matisse did, all the great modernists, they studied the figure. So I took a life drawing with knowing nothing, and I didn't know where to start. I didn't know what to do. These charcoal drawings, and after the second or third session, uh, I was only going on Saturday. I, was, I had work doing, I just had a job. And uh, the teacher came over and said, what is that? I said, what? He said, that. And he points. I said, well, those are her feet. And he said, I'm funny, is she wearing galoshes? And people started to laugh a little bit. And I was humiliated, of course. And then some, you know, some of the other students, who were much older, all of them older, said, he's just a jerk. Don't let him bother you. But it did bother me. And I saw how inept I was and how unable I was to, to, to do any relationship between what I saw and what, I, what came on the page. So I gave up. I gave up. I said, no, I love painting. I love art. But uh, it's not for me. And I began to write poetry. So about 15, 16, I was writing poetry, <laughs> ridiculous, pretentious poems, and I would send them all the way from the Bronx to, uh, to Manhattan, you know, to New Directions, for example. That was my favorite spot to send the poetry book, my poetry to. And they'd always been answered with a little note. I mean, it was so touching and so wonderful. Imagine that today. Now you, you don't exist. You know, no one answers anyone. But a little note. Thank you, Mr. Tutton. It's 15 and a half, 16. Thank you, Mr. Tutton, for your poem. Please, can, please keep sending us more poems. We have, we have a question. Uh, what kind of writing in 2023 is underappreciated? <laughs> what kind of writing? Did yes. You, I don't know if that's a trick question, a trap question. I don't know. One has to be very careful these days about uh, things like that. Well, I think uh, I would say in a very haughty and very arrogant and very snobbish way, what's underappreciated is good writing, beautiful writing, interesting writing, fresh writing, novel writing. Uh, I think what's underappreciated is the attempt to make work fresh and new and wonderful. Uh, I think that the marketplace dictates what happens in the, in the, in the world of writing. Uh, it's a cliche, but forgive me, but you know, you could be an artist and make uh, the most radical work and live decently, if not very well, because all you need is 10 collectors. You can't write a novel for 100 readers, 1,000 readers. You'll never publish again. So you, in a way, the marketplace dictates the kind of work that you would do and what kind of work that's being done, which you know, I, I long for a voice that's fresh, it's strange and new and wonderful. I find it mostly, I have found it mostly in, in Latin America and in, in, uh, and in Europe, most of the places I've found it. Uh, I think the most conventional work, I think, you know, doesn't come from much other places. I'm thinking, I was talking earlier to a young, young, uh, young student about a novel by Juan Rufo, Mexican writer now dead, unfortunately, but his one novel called Pedro Paramo, one novel, that's all he wrote. We are obsessed with quantity. We have to turn out book after book after book after book after book, a book a year and that makes you a professional writer. Juan Rufo wrote one novel, Pedro Paramo. It influenced everyone. Garcia Marquez, who wrote 100 Years of Solitude, Garcia Marquez said, we would not exist had not been this book. So some, I mean, it's so unusual. It's so mysterious. I'm sure, I don't know how it got published in its own time. I don't know how. It would never be published today, at least not in this world. I will, I will. Yeah, there are books that I love very, very much. I go back to that are just magic. 
I want magic in contemporary fiction. I want to see the magic again. I don't mean magic realism. I mean the magic of language, the magic of vision, the magic of the wisdom that comes from wisdom. Do we ever talk about wisdom anymore? There was always some way in which you read a novel that meant a lot to you. You don't know what it was that you came out with. You don't know it, it wasn't the formula, it wasn't the message, but you felt much wiser for it and you couldn't explain why. You, feel, you felt something had changed inside of you. Something had changed and you couldn't define it. I want that. Where is it? I mean, I'm sure it's there. I'm sure I'm benighted. I don't know enough to know I can't read that much stuff, but that's what I want. I want literature that makes me feel I'm alive and that part of why I'm alive is the literature. That among the reasons for living is literature. Not just to satisfy myself by reading another book, another book, another book. Who cares? I'd rather watch television at that point. You know, I say this as it's almost uh, boring myself, but you know, when I think of what we've seen on television, like The Sopranos, Breaking Bad, and there are other things, so great, so fresh, so powerful, memorable. We live with those characters. We live with, with Tony Soprano. We live with those people as we would have been in fiction. So yeah, if I'm going to, if I'm going to give my time now, I want to give it to something that really moves me. And uh, most fiction, I'm sorry to say, doesn't. It could be well made, well constructed, because everyone knows now the tricks, how to do it. You know, how you make the plot, how you make the arc of the arc of the narrative, all that stuff that you learn. Uh, so, it, yeah, I, I hope I didn't talk too much about that and wasn't concrete enough, but that's what I really, I crave. I remember when I was a kid, and I'm sure all of you feel the same way, who care about reading, how, what, well, maybe there was no television for me then, I was just a kid but how reading meant everything. You know, how I didn't want to go to sleep at night. I had a book, my mother would say, turn off the light, turn off the light, because I wanted to keep reading. It nourished me, it, it, it brought me places you know, that no kid from the Bronx would ever know about. But it was the stories that were wonderful, and they were done beautifully for their time. Yeah, I'm thinking about Robert Louis Stevenson, Kidnapped, Treasure Island, when you're a kid, those are magic books. I like magic. I guess that's what it is. I want to be transformed. I want a collaboration with the novel, the short story in transformation for both of us. I'm glad you asked that question. We Thank have you. another question. You want to move forward to that one? Another question? I'm shocked. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, we have a couple more, actually. So okay. tell me. Okay. Are there moments in life where you struggle to make sense of the present moment in language? What do you do in those circumstances? Are, are there moments in life that, what, please say it again? Where, where you struggle to make sense of the present moment in language. I, I'm a little confused, but is there, is, is, there, is there a moment that I can make sense of it? Where you struggle to make sense of the present moment in language. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you can rephrase the question. I, I don't know what that I don't really know what you mean. What it means. Um, so maybe this question, what does it mean to be a successful artist or writer today? All right. Well, today, but I'm not sure this isn't true always. It hasn't always been, always. Uh, in fact, it has to have always been. Success basically means two things. Uh, making a lot of money from your work and having visibility, having sort of near celebrity status as a writer. And that's success. The rest is the middle ground, mostly unknown by writers who are not known, by writers who will never be known, who will die unknown. That's not to say that the contemporary successful writer will have continuity. Because there are plenty of writers I know after my long life who were so famous in their time, so absolutely famous, their place was for posterity. People believed, oh, they're an American, they're, they're part of the American world of literature forever. And now we don't even know who they are. We don't even remember them. So it can't count really about 
what the, the value of the work is. We're talking about success and success as it is in for being a movie actor, a star, to stardom, or anything. Uh, fame, celebrity, uh, continuity, uh, not, not, name becomes a commonplace name. It becomes an ordinary part of the vocabulary of our language, of our culture. I think fewer and fewer writers have that, uh, that kind of wide recognition today. Fewer and fewer. And I think that it sort of closes down so that it becomes fame within a literary circle, not necessarily a general public. I mean, everyone who Charles Dickens was, everyone who Mark Twain was, they were international uh, figures. I'm not sure we have that today. Uh, so I think reputation is rather comparatively, comparatively speaking, localized. But there's no question in my mind, anyway, that fame is constituted of or constitutes or is constituted by uh, commercial success. You, you sell a lot of books, and you and you have, maybe you, you appear on conferences. You go to you, you're seen. You're seen. You're a quantity that's known. That's uh, virtually what I think it is. I don't think. Let me put put, put a parenthesis here. When I was a kid, which I hope I still am. When I was a real kid, you know, baby kid, it was clear to my friends and to my generation of thinking that there was a distinction between commercial success, fame, reputation, and art. Do I dare use that word? A-R-T, art. And that they were true artists. And they weren't famous and they weren't making fortunes. They weren't a household name. But that, yeah, you, so the, 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 the notion was, well, you guys, you people have your fame or your success, fine. Fine. But we're not confused that that gives it quality. The quality is from those who are outside that. We're doing the most beautiful work, the most important work. The, 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 the work that I said earlier has magic to it. So I, I'm, I'm, you know, we are a culture of celebrity. It's hard to avoid it, and it's hard not to be sucked in by it. It's very hard. Who wants to be alone? Who wants to be the, the one who you know, no one knows about? Really? Or ever, never know about. You know, you, your vanity doesn't allow that too much. So it's very hard to do. I had some students. I still feel pain for them. Uh, long ago, in the 70s, and they were doing experimental writing. Wonderful. I hate to use that word. I hate it. Whatever all writing is an experiment in a way. You're trying something to make it work. But really, uh, really daring. And they couldn't get published. They never got published. I felt terrible for them because they were so earnest and so careful, caring about what they were doing and caring about their mission. But we're swept away. All of us, in some way or another, whatever deep depth, without whatever depth or lack of depth of it, we can't help it. And uh, that's what I think is. Success. Uh, we don't have a we don't have a split culture, the commercial successful, the famous successful, and then the other work. Uh, you know, Faulkner, when he was at the height of his almost at the height of all his power, <laughs> he sold three thousand copies of his book. Three thousand copies. I mean, today, that would be impossible to be published to have him published keep publishing. So a lot of it has to do with the marketplace and a lot of it has to do with uh, what we talked about earlier, what I've elaborated about earlier forever. You know, ways in which work has been approached and the continuation of that same conventional approach. So the question is then, what kind of greatness are you gonna have? What kind of wonderful success is you gonna be from the point of view of something original? God forbid, original. If it's original, it's already probably outcast because that means it won't be popular. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Anyway, so to go back, also oh, uh, on that theme, this is that that sort of book I talked about, Gold Fools, that I wanted to nominate for this prize. The, the head of the the director of the what do you call it, of the three of us, there was one person who was in charge of it, wrote me a note which I saved and I published, saying, "Well, if we had an, if we had a, a, a section for originality, we might consider it. You imagine that if we had a section for prizes for originality." So, which means what? You don't want originality? No. This is an important prize. <laughs> Thank you for letting me blabber all this time. Yeah. I think, I think I think we'll leave it there. I think you have okay. opened up a world, uh, illumined a world that needs to be talked about, and you've shed a lot of wisdom here. And <laughs> talking about wonderful books, your books are wonderful, and I hope all our listeners reach read them. And I want to thank you for being, being our speaker tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lewis. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for all of you who are there and those of you who would be there. Take Great care. pleasure. Good night. Take care. Goodbye. Good night. Thank you. Goodbye. How am I getting off?